Happy Christmas. Thank you so much for coming out this evening, and we hope that you feel really warmly welcome this evening in, in this carol service for Mays Presbyterian Church. Um, do ask you at the end of the service, if you want to, to please do stay behind. There'll be mince pies uh, and other things filled with sugar that I'm sure you will not get more than enough of this Christmas, but we'd love to have you stay behind just for some time at the end. Um, just as we come now to worship God this evening, I thought I would read the words that um, Zachariah says whenever he finds out that John the Baptist is going to be born and he says praise be to the Lord the God of Israel because he has come to his people and redeemed them that's the God that we come this evening to worship first and foremost the God who doesn't stand far away and distant and somehow removed from us but the God who comes to us to save us simply because that's the sort of loving God he is. And we're going to worship him as we stand and sing our first item of praise, Once in Royal David's City. Let's stand and sing.
This reading is taken from Genesis chapter 3 and verses 1 to 15, the fall. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some of the fruit of the tree and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate it. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat, eat dust all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. I wonder if you've ever been in a situation similar to the one that sometimes happens to me at Christmas. You go in and the table is set for Christmas dinner. There's this wonderful, beautiful centerpiece that your, your mum made at a flower arranging workshop a few weeks prior. There, there's a turkey that has been done so perfectly that the skin on it is that kind of brown that you only ever see on the TV. And throughout the table, there's little, there's little bits of glitter, there's little, bit, little crackers on every plate. And the table is filled with food and entrees and sides and ornaments that you could never imagine. It, it looks so beautiful. It's the sort of thing that really you want to take a picture of it before anybody sits at it. But anyway, it's Christmas Day. You're all hungry. You've been waiting. It's now five o'clock. The, the lunch is meant to be on at three. So you all sit down at the table. And suddenly the, the, the picture perfect uh, Christmas table begins to break down because this dining table is usually meant for six, but it's now being forced to squeeze in 16 because those cousins who always wait until the last minute to let you know that they're coming have only let you know the day before and you didn't have time to get the other table that's been out in the garage all winter and so you've been forced to cram in and you're all doing impersonations of a T-Rex trying to get in at your dinner. And then in the midst of this cramped table, picturesque though it is, somebody at the far side of the table has the gravy. And, and you ask, oh, do you mind passing me the gravy a wee minute? And you reach across this table that's littered with all these wonderful delights, and then suddenly it happens. And there's always one person in the family who it always happens to, and it always tends to be me for some reason. You knock over a glass of something, and it goes spreading across the good tablecloth. Not the, not, not the usual one that's on it that you can wipe clean usually, it's the nice white one. And suddenly this big stain begins to appear in it. And then there's this mad dash of, oh, how do we clean it up? Two of the matriarchs in the family are arguing, do you dab the stain or do you rub it? And then there's also then a little dog that's been sitting in the corner. And in the midst of people trying to move plates and entrees so that you can get in at this, just as it begins to spill across the table, the dog has seen its chance. There is a little plate just perched so close to the edge of the table that it could be nabbed. And it jumps up, grabs a bit of the turkey and dashes off. And suddenly this really picturesque, this beautiful image of Christmas it's disappeared and it's descended into chaos, like it does every single year. And whenever we celebrate Christmas, we celebrate, yes, something perfect and wonderful and joyful coming into the world. But we start the Christmas story at the very start of humankind. Because we start the Christmas story saying that 
things aren't quite as they could have been. The wonderful Christmas dinner that could have been never was. And the wonderful perfect world that could have been never was. And like that pink stain that reminds you for year after year when your family make jokes of the fact that you spilt it, something on it last year, that that stays year after year. We confess that there's, as Christians, there's something not quite right with our world. There's something so much greater that could have been. There's something so much more wonderful that our world could have been filled with. And we're all filled with this longing for it to be made right. I was trying to find words to sum this up. And uh, there's an author, uh, Trish Warren, I thought put it really well. She said this, to practice Advent is to lean into an almost cosmic egg. Our deep, wordless desire for things to be made right and the incompleteness we find in the meantime. We dwell in a world that is racked with conflict, violence, suffering, darkness. But Advent holds space for all our grief. And it reminds us all that in one way or another, we are not only wounded by the evil that we see in the world around us, but we contribute, it, contribute to it in our own moments of unkindness, impatience, and selfishness. The Christmas story doesn't just begin with the angels appearing and telling a wonderful story of a savior to be born. The Christmas story begins in Genesis, as Andrew read, reminding us that there was something wonderful that couldn't, could have been, but never was. And at Christmas, it holds place for our joy, our happiness, and our wonder, and our hope. But for those of us who maybe feel Christmas can be a heavy time, it holds space for us to long for something that could have been, long for something greater, long for hope, and to long for our coming Savior. And that is summed up whenever we pray, come Lord Jesus, and in the words of what's one of my favorite Christmas carols, O come, O come, Emmanuel, as we long for the day when what could have been will be made right and perfect before our eyes. And we're going to stand and sing as we worship God in, that, in the next song, O come, O come, Emmanuel.
This reading is taken from Isaiah chapter 9 and uh, part of chapter 11 as well. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bat across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be in his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness. From that time on and forever, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. In chapter 11, the branch from Jesse. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of God will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of the knowledge and fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. You know, each year we probably try to reach that postcard Christmas, and yet we never quite reach it. Um, Zoe and I, the other night, watched um, the BBC Christmas film that they put out last year, um, Click and Collect. I don't know if any of you have seen it. Um, it's kind of like a one-hour version of Arnold Schwarzenegger's Jingle All the Way, if you remember that, maybe, where in the desire to have the perfect Christmas and to have everything perfect and the perfect presents to give to the kids. Um, the dad decides that they have to get hold of this one toy, but here's the problem is that it's the toy is sold out everywhere and they have to go get it. So in the BBC version, Click and Collect, which is on iPlayer and I heartily recommend it, um, they drive for seven hours and it's kind of this kind of two, the original odd couple, one guy's really uptight and the other one's really relaxed and full of fun and they kind of bicker their way up. Like, it's a great watch, and I know that's not why you came here this evening to get TV recommendations, but um, you've got one. Um, but it's this drive that we all have. You know, we want to have the perfect Christmas. We want it to be wonderful. We want our kids to have the best thing. We want to uh, give the best presents. We want to have the best meal. Like, I wonder how many of us will spend so many more hours over our Christmas dinner because we know we need to impress that family member who impressed us last year. And yet it never does quite measure up. And what do we say every year after Christmas? Next year, we'll do this. Next year, we won't get the tree from Ikea that you got thinking it would be really, really narrow. And then you get home to realize that it's really two meters wide and one meter tall. Next year, we're not going to get that toy that we knew ended up the box was only going to be played with. Next year, we're not going to eat the tub of celebrations to ourselves. Next year, we're not going to make as much food for Christmas dinner because we know that Aunt Bessie doesn't really eat that many Brussels sprouts to begin with. We make all these promises next year, and we know that next year, we're all going to do exactly the same thing, or at least I am. Maybe that speaks to, to me more than anything. Because we make all these promises to ourselves and that great holiday of making promises to yourselves that you intend to break New Year's Eve is just around the corner. And we live in a world filled with broken promises that says, next time I will do this or in the future I will do this. And then we forget or it becomes too easy to just slip back into the old way or we end up buying the thing that we said we wouldn't buy, or we end up making more food than we said we would make, or we do the thing we said we wouldn't do. But what we read, or what we read in Isaiah there, is a wonderful promise. And it's written at the very, very shortest distance of time, 600 years before the birth of Jesus. 600 years, that is, that is so long ago, I don't think any of us can probably even remember or count anything that happened 600 years ago. I know I can't off the top of my head. It is a, a time frame that we just can't comprehend. 
It is lifetimes of lifetimes. It is so much further than we could ever imagine, let alone trying to remember to keep a promise. And yet, what's the wonderful hope of, prom- or what's the wonderful hope of Christmas? Yes, there's a problem to solve, but it's not a problem for us to try and work out by ourselves. Because at Christmas, we get to encounter the character of a God who is the sort of God who will keep a promise of 600 years in the making. That from the shoot of Jesse, from from the son of David, there will rise somebody who will save us from our sins. What kind of God do we worship at Christmas? What kind of savior do we celebrate? We celebrate a savior who is thoroughly unlike us because we celebrate a savior who keeps his promises, promises centuries in the making. And that promise is that one day there will be a wonderful counselor who will come to us. Our savior, Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, Almighty God made flesh among us. It's a wonderful hope and it's a wonderful promise. And it's a promise that we can lean into and trust in with all of our hopes for this Christmas. Because we have a God who is thoroughly unlike any of us in that he's a God who is true to every every dot and every tittle of his word. We worship a God who keeps his promises. We worship a God who is a wonderful counselor, a mighty God, a prince of peace.
This reading is taken from John chapter 1, verses 1 to 14. The Word became flesh. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light, he came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to the world was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or of a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. I wonder what you sit down to watch after, on a, after you've had your dinner and everything on Christmas, on Christmas Day. I, I remember there was a TV show on a few years ago, and it, they've re-ran it a few times, but um, I, don't think, I don't know if they're running it this year. It was called A Grumpy Guide to Christmas. Maybe some of you remember it. What it was was a list of comedians, uh, and they would basically ask them what was their least favorite thing about Christmas, and they would do what I think is probably a national pastime for us, and what we kind of love, they've got to have a good old gurn. And you've got to watch the TV and have a good old gurn along with them, being, oh, I hate that, oh, that annoys me as well. And I wonder if you sit and you look around Christmas and you go, oh, you know, Christmas, Christmas used to be a lot more important whenever I was younger. You know, it's got a lot more plastic. It's got a lot more fake. And as I remember being told many times whenever I was a kid, you know, back in my day, we were happy only with an orange in our stocking. And it seems funny that the further we go down the line and the further we more we try to focus on the presence and the more we try to focus on the lights and the more we try to focus on the dinner, the more fake and the more plastic and hollow Christmas seems to feel. One of the things I love about Christmas uh, and, is, and driving around and seeing at Christmas time, there's all the different lights. Um, some of you, I'm sure, will have been to Christmas lights turn-ons, or you'll put lights up around the house, or lights up in your garden, or you'll go to that one person's house who lives near you, who has went all out for Christmas. Um, whenever I was growing up, there was a, a little uh, garden in Dervik, which we would drive to on a family outing on Christmas Eve, just to look at the Christmas lights. And, you know, the lights are beautiful. You know, you can see the wee tea lights that have been lit along the sides of the hall, and they're lovely, aren't they? Like, it's just something really appealing to look at. But one of the reasons we have these little small lights at Christmas is that they're meant to be like little tokens, little reminders, little, little glimpses at the greatest light there is at Christmas. Because these lights are beautiful. They're lovely and they're picturesque. But at Christmas, we celebrate the most beautiful and wonderful light that mankind has ever seen. As Jenna read for us there, Christmas is about the light of the world, Jesus Christ coming down, filling our world with a hope, a hope that all the what-ifs and all the should have beens that we feel when we look around us and we see the evilness and the wickedness in the world, a hope and a light and a future that we can look to the Son of God who will one day come back and redeem it all. We're filled at Christmas time with all these pictures of wonderful little things, of presents and lights and dinners and feasting and rejoicing. And yet, the more we make those things the ultimate end in Christmas, the more hollow Christmas seems to feel. Can I encourage you this evening, whenever you're celebrating Christmas this week, don't settle for a poor substitute of the real thing. 
Don't think the beauty of the Christmas lights are the greatest beauty to be had this Christmas. And don't think the 14th pair of socks is the best present you're going to be given this Christmas. We celebrate the Jesus who all of these things point to because in him there is the depth and the richness and the truest meaning of Christmas that we can be saved from our sins and we can be made children of God. And that's the wonderful hope that causes us to want to sing and adore him. And we're gonna do that now as we stand and sing, O come all ye faithful. And as we sing that, um, the offering will be received. Well, we bow our heads and pray, and you can have a sit down as well. <laughs> um, Father, at Christmas time, we celebrate and we feast and we enjoy, in a sense, what, a, what we've had from the year before. And Father, the offering that we've given this evening, we pray that you would use it to bless and to help those who are less fortunate than us this Christmas. Father, we pray you would use it to build your church and to spread the wonderful good news we celebrate at Christmas. God came down as a saviour. And Father, we pray for all of those who this Christmas may be a little lonelier. There may be a face that was once around the table who isn't there anymore. There may be those who are maybe ill, those who are unable to come and join family who were once able to. And Father, we pray for them and we pray that as we say so much of the name of Jesus being Emmanuel this Christmas, that for those people who are suffering or going through hardship, that Emmanuel would be so true to them as they know that God is with them each and every moment. Father, bless all of us who are gathered here this Christmas. Help us to fix our eyes so squarely on Jesus. Help him be our all and our everything because he is the richest and fullest sense of all that we do. 
And Father, we pray this all in his name and by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Luke 2, verses 1 to 7, <clears throat> the birth of Jesus. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the very first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them.
final reading is taken from Matthew 2, verses 1 to 12. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw a star in the, and rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard that he was, dist he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem of Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you Bethlehem in the land of Judah, and by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd in my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen, when it rose, went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. At, at Christmas, we celebrate the coming of the king. And I think we can have a very rose-tinted view of what goes on in the Christmas story. It sounds this wonderful story of this unlikely couple who end up having a baby in the wildest of, of circumstances, and we end the story with this lovely little baby. And it's nice, and it's cute, and it's very picturesque. And yet we forget how earth-shatteringly important this coming of a king is. I wonder, have any of you ever been to Buckingham Palace? Um, a few years ago, uh, we went, my, my sister was graduating over in London, and me and my dad went, and we'd never been to London before, um, so we did all the things that you shouldn't do, like trying to talk to people on public transport and uh, things like that. But we went up to the front gates of, Booking, of Buckingham Palace. We, we, didn't, we did, hadn't booked a tour or anything to go in because that cost money, and we're from North Antrim, and so um, <laughs> stereotypes work their way out. But we went up to the gates and there was a security guard standing, kind of a police uniform with a gun and everything. And we looked through the gate and saw that there was this big ramp that would raise in and out of the ground like this. Uh, and we went up to him and we asked, oh, what's, what's the big ramp for? And they go, oh, it's so that if people try to ram through the gates that this big barrier stops them and they can't get through. And being, my dad works in diggers and on a farm, so we're very... We've been around machinery pretty much all our lives, and so this was a new piece of machinery, and so we were interested, and we asked, oh, like, how, how's it operated? Is, is it a hydraulic thing? And um, the security guard replied, yeah, yeah, it is, a, it is a hydraulic thing. And then my dad then asked him, I suppose you have to have a separate generator for it in case somebody cuts the power. <laughs> now, when you're Northern Irish and you're asking a policeman in London <laughs> the security details of Buckingham Palace, you get moved on pretty quick. <laughs> and you know, like we couldn't have walked up to Buckingham Palace that day in the best will of, in the world and just wandered on in and asked to have a cup of tea with Queen Elizabeth. It just wouldn't have happened. It, it would have been unbecoming, I think is probably the language he would have used. And yet, and yet at Christmas we celebrate what is in many ways a very unbecoming story of the coming of a most extraordinary king. Have you ever thought what it meant for hands 
that had flung stars into space to suddenly have to learn what it meant to grasp things and hold things in them again. A mouth that had once spoken, let there be light, and there was light, suddenly has to grapple with syllables and say things like da-da. Feet that would one day walk on water, feet that had walked in the furnace with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, now suddenly we're not able to hold a small, frail human frame. God came down at Christmas. Our King in heaven refused to remain there, but came down to save us. And it wasn't some tokenistic act. It was an amazing act of humility, where he looked at us, saw that there was nothing terribly impressive about us, but because it's the sort of God who he is, thought, I will go to them and I will save them. I will be their God, and they will be my people. That age-old promise that is read again and again in Scripture becomes true as King Jesus is born. And in this unlikely manger, in the least regal circumstances that we could ever imagine, the undoubtedly most influential figure that has ever walked on the face of this earth was born. God in the flesh. This is the life-changing truth of Christmas. That we we have a God who isn't far off and removed, doesn't look at the sins and the mistakes that we make and say, well, you've got yourself into this mess. You work a way out of it. We worship a God who sends his son down to become God-made flesh. Not in a throne room. Not even in a nice, clean NHS hospital. But into a manger. Our God came to dwell. I wonder what your thought is about God whenever you come into church. And I think whenever we come in, we can sometimes feel that he's very far away, feel that he hasn't been with us the past six days, and maybe if we're not terribly regular at church, we maybe feel that, well, this is just us going through the motions at the minute. But can I encourage you, especially this Christmas, to celebrate the wonderful truth that we believe, that we call Jesus king, but he is not a tyrant king. He is a king who is willing to leave the realms of perfections and glory to come down in the most humble of ways, to live the most ordinary and perfect of life, to save the most sinful people like us for no other reason then that's just the kind of God who he is. This is our king. Can I encourage you to get to know him? And I pray that as you get to know him, you see the wonderful glory that is shown in this newborn king. And we're going to sing his praises as we sing, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Let's stand and sing.
And now may the God of hope fill you all with joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with the, with the hope by the power of his Holy Spirit through the Son and in the name of the Father forever and ever. Amen. <laughs>